Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Tara Robinson, with Mage the Podcast. And today's guest is David from the Drunken Storyteller Podcast. Uh, David is working on a publication about divination and how to use that in RPGs. Mage is an RPG. Mage contains divination, so David sounded like a good person to talk to. You may have also heard David's work on Darker Days Radio and does thing with the grim dark skull crusher setting or whatever the proper term for the warded hammer is. Grim, dark, skull crushing, orc, wag. It's very high on the, I'm glad you enjoy that scale. Like, it's just one of those things where it's never leapt out to me as being a thing to approach, but a lot of people like it. So there's probably something there. Same thing with country music. So, mm -hmm. It's one of the world's biggest selling fantasy and sci-fi settings. It's got to appeal to somebody. Yes, it's, it's doing something right. <laughs> it, it, it's got me three publications out there. So I've definitely something's going right for me with that yeah. one. <laughs> so getting into it, how did you get into RPGs? Like, what what was your first? You know, with the conversation we were just having a minute ago before we went live about me picking up Mage, the Ascension 2nd Edition. Uh-huh. It was that. Oh, that's terrifying. That's full circle. It was the first time, I'd, I, first time I went to university. I've been to university many times. Either that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure yet. First time I went to university... A group of my friends were playing Vampire the Masquerade at the time, guessing that was also second edition. I got invited to one game, played it. The group then fell apart, as all typical role plays go. I went into a the local game shop, saw this really pretty purple slip sleeve book with mage written on the side of it, and went, I'm going to buy that. Bought that, opened it, read it, put it back in the shelf, and never read it again. <laughs> you're officially a mage player you've met the requirement you were part of a world of darkness game that fell apart and you read the core rule book you're yep. <laughs> you now part of the few and the proud from there i dabbled in D, D for a little bit did a bit of dark heresy warhammer 40k dark heresy and rogue trader i then traveled the world and did various things and was not in the uk for some time i came back to the uk and chris handley from dark days radio was someone i used to work with in games workshop in manchester god 20 years ago i'm reminding you of that one 20 years ago he got in contact with me and said do you want to join darker days radio and talk about warhammer rpgs and i went yes i dabbled a little bit since i'd come back with pathfinder for some reason i don't know why i did that i'd done some iron kingdoms rpg uh, when they had their own system before that's basically it and then yeah got into it through darker days radio bringing me in what is the drunken storytellers podcast this was my my way of dealing with lockdown in a way during the beginning of the pandemic one of the things i like to do in my spare time is read folklore books occult weirdness just because it's fun. And I was drunkenly talking to a friend one night and they said, why don't you record a podcast about it and, and, and tell the stories? Because you're drunk and telling me stories. Why not drunkenly tell other people's stories? And that's where the podcast comes from. I delve into the folklore and mythology from across the world, kind of compare and contrast some stories from around the place. Depending on how much time and things I have, I either just read the stories or I delve into the background and things of them. I have done a few episodes with a friend, Fiona, from the What Am I Rolling podcast, where we talk about some of the festivals and how you can apply them to, to role plays as well. So it's just kind of like folklore from around the world and hear some really cool stories go and enjoy it and occasionally have a drink looking over recent episodes you did one was on the role of uh, ouija in japan yes what is that what's the, can you give us kind of the thumbnail of of what that is because that sounds fascinating so i spent quite some time in japan and so the ouija uh, the ouija board that we all love and know comes around from about the 19 8, 1860s or so from the spiritualism movement within the us and when the us moved over to japan and captain perry came in and brought in his soldiers and weird history not going to get involved in that comment but they they a lot of the, the sailors and soldiers were spiritualists and they brought over the the, the ouija board and the japanese people thought this was really interesting and so they kind of borrowed the idea and created what is known as kokori-san. I do actually talk when we get into the main topic there is actually a little bit about this in in the book that we're going to talk about but the kokori-san is a Japanese version of the Ouija board or a spirit board I and mean, it has its own little setup its own little layout and you you kokori-san ouide desu ka are you there and you kind of then ask it questions and you move a penny around or a little planchette around with your fingers in very much the same way as the Ouija board works. The fun thing with this 
is in the 70s, before the American satanic panic happened, there was a bit of a satanic panic kind of thing that happened in Japan, where the kokori-san got very, very popular in high schools. And all the girls in the high schools would go around and play it at lunchtime. And all the parents got really, really scared and really worried. And it swept across the nation of this panic over Kokori-san. So you had this kind of weird, slightly pre-satanic panic, satanic panic in Japan. But there's a whole history on on my episode in more detail on that. So, And there's another podcast, Uncanny Japan, who talk about it and do it really, really well. Oh, interesting. I'll include links to that in the show notes. Dumb question. The Ouija board was born out of the late 19th century and Perry was the early 19th century. So was it a predecessor to the to the Ouija board or was it another divination board or is the timeline different? The timeline's slightly different. So Captain okay. Perry came over and that opened up Japan to the West as Edo became the capital of Japan and all the, all the dealings and tradings with the West started. That's when the spiritualism came over and started to come over with that. And then with the concept that we know of the Ouija board, that did come out of the American Civil War. Whether there were versions, we kind of think there were versions beforehand for this, but they just were not famous and they were not well known. It was only kind of the American Civil War that suddenly made that spirit board idea grow because families want to know how are my loved ones okay? Are they dead on a field somewhere? Can I go and talk to them? Yes, here's a spirit board. Go talk to them. And I like that. And it, moving that into mage terms, it, it lets us tap into kind of three veins. One, the idea that different cultures are going to use similar implementations, possibly for uh, different purposes, in the same way that somehow the Taroki deck got turned into the modern tarot, where it was just like a household object that was almost used as a form of sortilege. Suddenly the deck became its own thing, that you could have a character that plays up the fact that, oh no, there is a different set of cultural associations with this object. Two, I always like in Mage, when we have kind of a Magey version of it, so I would love to see a, I like the similar pronunciation of Meiji and Meiji in this case, yeah. but that you could have a, a mage Ouija board that has dozens of extra symbols on it that are of arcane influence or importance. You could have the hermetic version that has the alchemical symbols. You could have the chorister one that has ties to the saints and so on, mm -hmm. and that we can just do kind of this reskin, but also this general idea that mages go a little bit deeper than most mortals would. So this hollower using it as this implement of kind of kitsch, like this, I knew it before it was cool. And they have this 1870s version where the symbols are on a slightly different layout or it's just Made not the hipster. Well, yeah. Oh yeah. You're like, oh, <laughs> celestial choristers are like, oh, you thought that was cool on vinyl? Well, I have it on Wandering Minstrel. <laughs> That's pretty common. I'm doing obviously the book and we'll talk about that in a bit. But one of the things that we do talk about within that is using these things as inspiration to create your own ideas. And one of the things I, when I was thinking about doing this and writing it, one of the reasons the company I'm doing the book with generally do a lot of D and D and fantasy stuff. And I'm like, I play a lot of horror and, and a lot of sci-fi stuff. How can we apply these concepts to that? And so Ouija boards in a modern setting or, or industrial setting, you then take in those things and you, you modify them and you skin them to kind of the worlds that you, you think are really, really cool and um, how, how to fit them within that. But there's also what you, one of the things you said there with the, the tarot deck and coming from the, the original Italian there are many, many, many forms of divination that grew up around the world in different cultures that are similar. So there's scapulomancy or plastiomancy, which is the burning of bones and seeing the cracks in the bones and, and them then giving you a, a, the patterns give you a divination. This grew up in North American traditions and in Chinese traditions at the same time, about five, six hundred years ago what I can tell dates if he but completely separate in completely different parts of the world but at the same time with the same kind of ideas the world's a strange place I ran into scapulomancy originally as pyromancy and I'm like oh man fire divination this is good oh wait you burn bones but now it turns out that those divination tools those seeing bones are some of the oldest examples of writing we have because burnt etched bone lasts way longer than a lot of anything else yeah, yeah than a lot of inks are going to and i like the fact that it is described it is divided into pyromantic and apyromantic schools and and whenever i see that in mage i always like the idea that yes this is a type of divination but you need access to 
dragon bones for this to work. And the only thing that can scorch dragon bones is going to be the direct fires of the sun or a nuclear blast requiring this Mm -hmm. weird combination where you need to have your master or forces master, master of forces or master of matter, get together with someone who can track down a dragon bone to make an appropriate divination. And whenever we can get kind of those weird combinations, I'm a fan of it. So... I need to get hold of these really very, very specific items that might exist on the other side of the world or the other side of the galaxy. How do we get everyone together? And you kind of then build up a story around that entire aspect of going out and getting these things for the divination. Yeah, you need a bone from an extinct creature that is not actually as extinct as we think it is. You need to go into the middle umbra, and now you need to make an agreement to talk with Mother Dolphin, who still has access to one of the few remaining stellar sea cows out there. Or you need a great auk bone or a bit of dodo shell for something to work. And the Mm -hmm. last two have been ferried away. Does your group come up with a clever alternative? Or... Can I justify to the spirit of this creature that no, the death of 10% of what your species has remained is justified for this thing that I need to do? That's a. Oh, I'm now thinking of changeling bargains. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you bring up the idea that there are contracts tied to kind of this mythopoetic force of fairy in Chronicles of Darkness or the Dreaming in yeah. World of Darkness. And it is not uncommon for those supernatural bargains to be very specific and remarkably punishing. So if you, oh God, yes. if you have agreed to do a particular kind of offering or, satisfi- or sacrifice, uh, the dreaming doesn't care that there are no longer European lions. It doesn't care that there aren't <laughs> dire wolves anymore. You need to come up with one or insert tragedy here. We've jumped into kind of the the divination. One last thing to kind of bridge the two yeah. topics. From my limited understanding of Warhammer, there is a tarot analog in that game. What is that? Yeah, so in Warhammer Wrath and Glory, so the 40k version of Warhammer, there is something known as the Emperor's Tarot, the Emperor's Tarot, which is a psychoactive tarot deck that rather than in the concepts that we know of the tarot deck or cardomancy, where we imprint ourselves on the cards and we, we, we tie our psychic abilities to the cards and then we deal them and therefore like the cards read through it, this is a lot more physical, a lot more actual connection with the psychic because we have to have this real connection with more psychology, psychics within the universe. Cards, when they get drawn, will show you images that have a, an actual psychic image on them and psychic connections to the person who is drawing them and the, the, the person they're drawing them about. Within the RPG, there's not much written about them. And one of the things that I like to do when I run Wrath and Glory, if we're bringing in the the Empress Tarot, is have it very much connected to the planet that you're you're playing on. So if you are on a hive world, so a a world which is just fully populated as as, as industry and, and humanity, think Coruscant, but full of industry. Horizon, but shitty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Grim dark. Yeah. <laughs> surprisingly. Enough. Yep. This entire um, is, planet is full of turd farmers. Welcome to to Warhammer. As they draw the the deck out and draw out the cards, the the images on the cards would appear, and they'd they'd morph and change depending upon kind of the latent psychic energy of the area that you're in. So if you're in a city, you'd get more mechanical and more brutal looking Im- images. Where if you're in a forest jungle world you'd get more viney, greeny looking images and things. So it picks up on the latent psychic energy of the things around them in a kind of very much more, I suppose, what you could say a very realistic view of what some people imagine tarot really does. And is this something where it works? Like, is there a mechanism in the game such that it does deliver true visions of the future? Or is this one of those things where it is intended kind of to inspire and guide the user? Like, I guess the question is, does foresight or does prophecy in a true sense exist within the Warhammer universe? Like, are there true seers? Okay. There is prophecy and and, and foretelling within the Warhammer universes in, in any of the games that they have it. In forty in forty K, Wrath and Glory, the Ad- Adeptus Mechanicus, who are a race of cyborgs who hate the flesh but were flesh, they have a lot of divination to do with numerology and machines, uh, the machine cult. 
and the Omnisire, the humans, they have the emperor, the psychoactive tarot, who has, then there are prophets and street sellers and seers and all sorts of things like that. Same within the Warhammer fantasy and Age of Sigmar settings. There is very, very much a, a, a prophecy system within, not written within the games, but they are very much part of the universe. Okay. And, and this I kind of like as a, as a mage idea. One, I think there is likely a divination tool within the technocracy that is not called the tarot, but is the uh, 78 analects of prediction that are available. Yeah. And you look at it, you're like, that's that's an effing tarot. And instead you, of the mages, you, just you have yourself a tarot code. Yeah. Um, and you have the inventor. Instead of the fool, you have the ignorant or something like that. Instead of mm. the ace of swords or ace of wands or something like that, you have the perfect of discovery or something like that. Almost drawing on that Blakeian sense that that the, the suits of tarot can be tied to different things. Well, we see that in kind of anyway within tarot. So you've got your, your traditional tarot, mm -hmm. which everybody knows, and you've got all those suits that you've just listed. But then going through it, there are multiple different versions of it. So you can go straight to the Toth deck from Thelema. That's a 78-card deck, but has different names for the cards. So we see even within, within the tarot that there are differences within them. So people take, pick and choose for whatever suits their needs. I also like the idea of a psychoactive tarot, that there are a set of decks or oracle decks or something similar that are out there in the mage world. And you can use them as a simple deck, but a character with Mind 3 Spirit 2 can connect themselves to this deck that is a combination tool of the oracle and oracle, um, almost like the, uh, the Buddhist definition of oracle, where a, a spirit may possess yeah. you in certain schools. And to use it is pretty harrowing that each spread requires you to take two bashing damage or to spend a willpower point. But you yeah. are tapping into a pretty potent spirit in, in the process of it. Yeah. Uh, reading up the Warhammer stuff, I also like the idea that like as humanity opposes the chaos gods, that there is some sort of anti-tarot out there. That it is a deck that does not sow prophecy, but sows confusion. Yes. That there is this yeah. anti-deck that prevents, that acts as a, a shield from the activities of others or can be used to upset the natural balance, quote unquote, natural balance of the things and introduce chaos into the world. Fun, fun thing again with these as well is a, an Empress Tarot can turn into the anti-tarot deck depending upon the mind of the person who's using it hmm. and whether they then start to get actually get influenced by the warp and the chaos gods. They don't notice that the change is happening and then suddenly the tarot is now a, a, something completely different and the messages that they're getting, they think are from the emperor, but for somehow you've now got this corn demon who's telling you to go rip everybody's heads off. So we have made our sideways thing in to this. Uh, the notional topic we are discussing is you have a product that is going out to Kickstarter on divination, scrying, and other uh, forms of of prediction that are available in culture and can be introduced into RPGs. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what this project is. As I've said, I, I have a mild passing interest in the occult and, and, and weirdness and folklore and things and a mild passing interest in RPGs. And I thought, well, there's, there's this weird thing that happens in certain RPG systems that shall remain nameless, but are trying to fix their ways by putting out new digital content that probably won't fix it, where there's a lot of really bad cultural appropriation and really bad representation of certain cultures that use certain religious and divinational practices. And I thought, well, I know something about this. I have friends who are part of these cultures, and I know they don't like this. Can we get together and write a book that looks at this from an, the divination from an academic and historical point of view, and then apply these as inspiration to our RPGs? And that's kind of where the book came from. Um, the idea I kind of got a couple of months ago, and it's kind of snowballed and grown from a short little leaflet book that we were going to do into probably nearly about 120 pages at A5. It's a book on taking real world divination from history and folklore and applying it into tabletop RPGs, doing it with sensitivity because some people still do believe these things or have connections to the cultures. It is one of those things where we say some people still believe this. We are not saying that incredulously like some people believe in the four humors, mm. but it is frequently the case that dead beliefs aren't nearly as dead as people think they are. And there are still people who, where this is an active part of their uh, faith or personal practice. And we have no interest in, in, in diminishing that. Where do you see most RPGs 
flubbing it? Like, what mistakes do you see them making that if you were able to say, hey, stop doing these four things or something like that, the the things that whenever you see them make you go, ah. The most obvious one that always gets my heckles up big is the representation of certain cultures, specifically the Roma culture. They have been notoriously used throughout the RPG history, right from the very beginning, from D&D, even through fantasy before that, as your stereotypical fortune teller you'd see on the street. They'd be cast as the woman in bright coloured rags with dangly gold bits on them with a crystal ball hunched over and and things like that. And they're taking these images from a very marginalised culture, a culture that has been historically marginalised, shat on, excuse the language, and some very bad history has been applied to them and portraying them in this way, in the way that games like D&D do. And I love the game, but the jump start for the came from beyond the grave has one of these characters in it i know it's meant to be a trope of a movie but the movie is the real cultures they get portrayed badly uh, it's the same thing with hoodoo and voodoo generally being portrayed in very specific ways that are not really what they are about so that's probably my biggest one uh, short of getting a master's degree as it were how do we overcome that is this just a case where we just don't use it or is there some way that we can subvert or take this and turn it i think we need to take it and subvert it we as role players don't have the knowledge of the history that the history professors and things do so we don't know the full extent of a lot of the the troubles and things behind these people or how badly they've been marginalized but what we can do is we can go well that looks very very tropey that that looks like you've just stolen that straight out of something from the 1800s and is not particularly nice can i reskin that in a way that is less like this one of the simplest ways to do it is change the way they look if you've got a, a profit or a seer on the street don't make them a hunched over hag in these purple and gold and green robes make them a tall upstanding citizen make them just look normal why do they have to have this specific thing yes i know that then so he goes ah yes they're the person we need to speak to but do they really all need to look like that can we not just have them look like a normal person and there's probably a set of secondary cues that we can have to this person where there are other signs, as it were, of the trade outside of that stereotypical association where it's like, ha, huh, you know that you're supposed to meet this person in the market square. Your perception plus Enigma's role has you reveal that this person has a, this otherwise unassuming businesswoman has a set of rings that appear to be etched with the marks of the younger Futhark to them. Or this person yeah. has a, a third eye tattoo inset between their thumb and forefinger on their left hand or something like that. Like, as you mentioned, we can be a lot more subtle with these things. It's also one of those things where like, it is really hard to present a trope that is a exact replica of the trope that you then try and subvert. That is always harder than I think it's going to be. Yeah. And I just got out oh, of the industry it's... of trying to do it. Yeah, it's one of those things where I like to use the phrase and some people might do with this. It's you're never going to be perfect, but trying to be perfect, we're going to be imperfect. So it's better to be imperfectly perfect than perfectly perfect because you're never going to be perfectly perfect. Accept that you are going to make mistakes, accept them and go, sorry, I put your hand up, own it and go, OK, yes, I've learned from that. How can I make it better? And it's one of those things where I have had to, in the past, retcon characters in my own games when I realized, oh, wow, this is really pulling in this particular direction that I didn't intend it to be. Don't hesitate to do that. It's a story we tell with our friends. If anyone's going to argue that our stories aren't internally consistent, eh. <laughs> so if you realize you're you're leaning into a trope or a stereotype, you can just change it and retcon it and continue, yep. continue otherwise. After that, are there any questions we should have of respect for cultures that aren't extant in some way. The example I will use, there's not a lot of people from Nineveh who are worshipping Ishtar. Is mm. there a respect or duty that we owe to non-extant cultures, in your opinion, or ones that are only available as being heavily reconstructed, as in the chain of belief has been clearly broken for possibly centuries, and people have gone back to create almost a, a modern interpretation of it? 
Well, it, that's that's a hard one. I would say if there is people who are still actively following a belief, you can trace back, even if it's only 10 or 20 people in a small community, we still owe them the ability to treat it well. Many cultures and many religions are dying out as our world changes and becomes more technologically advanced and, and we all kind of start to turn into a big mushy ball of humanity. I do think there is a, a duty of care to preserve these things. And so if we then start taking these ideas and throwing them into RPGs or fantasy books or rock things and changing them, how are they then going to be presented in the future? Are, are then people going to come back and do what these recreationists are doing? Take and go, oh, look, there's this book here. It's got this. Hit. This is must be what they believed. And yet they've picked up a Vampire the Masquerade book. In regards to recreationist religions, so uh, one of the big ones, really, I'm probably going to get shouted out from a lot of people for saying this, are the Nordic religions. Mm -hmm. A lot of these are reconstructed from Christian texts. It's hard to say. We can't really say. We, I know a lot of people who are Nordic pagan, and they have to take what they can get, and they have to learn through practice. So changing them, maybe if we, we accidentally write something in a game or in a book, and then it resonates with somebody who is a practitioner. They go, actually, hang on a minute. That feels right. But because they're trying to reconstruct a religion, we don't know whether it's right or not. So there's probably very strong historical arguments against it. I'm less inclined to be upset, personally myself. I'm not saying about anybody else here. If you take certain parts of certain religions that are we know are reconstructed parts of the religion and maybe throw your own, own style on it, because we've got this whole thing at the moment in Nordic religions with the blood eagle. There's a lot of arguments. You see these things in in like the Northmen and Vikings and stuff with very specific rituals and things. In history, we kind of unsure really what happened and why. Theory ideas, but the specifics are very, very vague as to what Blood Eagle really was about. And there aren't many examples of it actually happening. You've got to take from very small bits of information to create a grander picture. So, But what it is kind of a type of ritual execution that involves a very specific, very visceral in the literal sense. Mm. And we're not sure if it is a literary invention, a mistranslation, an accurate historical thing. And we just, there isn't enough evidence all pointing in the same direction for a preponderance yeah. of scholars to agree. A lot of the evidence comes from the skaldic poetry and the sagas and things. There are a few physical remains that show that they've had the, the back of the rib cage ripped open. Why that happened is unknown in most contexts. So we have these things from one side of literary history, which we generally written by non-believers Christians. And then we have the physical evidence that these things happened. What was the real story? <laughs> and, and this is a constant problem that we have with any number of other faiths or belief practices that dealt with being contacted by colonialism. A lot of the information we have on the Incas mm -hmm. or the Mayans is what Christian yeah. missionaries wrote down. It is also something that we are dealing with in a more European context, as it were, in the forms of mm. uh, the Albigensians or any number of heresies where we don't necessarily have original text. We just have a list of why they were wrong. And from that, we kind of need to uh, to infer what's happening there. So one day I will do my episode on the history of Gnosticism and Gnosticism in the world of darkness, but uh, that, that day is not oh, today. please do. <laughs> Going through the, the book itself, chapter one is listed as oracles, prophets, and seers. What is the difference between these kind of three different roles, mantles, or beliefs that someone can have? Oddly enough, oracles are not actually people oracles are the temples in, in one way of saying it they are the places where a prophet so they would be the big famous one is the oracle of delphi the oracle of delphi is actually a temple to apollo in the area of delphi in greece so the oracle itself is the building its prophet or the delphi is kept so that's what an oracle is despite what other people may think the oracle in the classical sense is the big grand temple where a prophet goes if you're doing a big grand kind of divination and prophet a prophet is somebody who has a divine connection and is able to speak to the gods and deliver messages or deliver fortunes or foretellings your general 
talking to the god, this is what they want you to do, person. A seer is someone who does not have a divine connection. They can see signs. They will look at the sky and see the birds. They'll see ants crawling along the floor. They'll see cracks in the rock and go, ah, this is a sign from the god, and it means this, possibly, maybe. A lot less certainty about it. There is no direct communication between the seer and the, the gods, so to speak. There's no divinity within what they do. And that's kind of the three levels of what they are. In the book, I kind of give examples. So I've, I talk about the Oracle of Delphi. I also mention Mothership and Nostradamus in there as kind of examples of prophets. So Mother Shipton was kind of, she's a famous lady from Nairsborough in, in England. She's an amazing character, kind of a herb woman, local healer, but also gave out prophecies, predicted the end of the world. Her prediction is about a bridge, that if the bridge falls three times, the end of the world will come. The bridge has only fallen twice so far, so go protect that bridge, everybody. But her prophecies were only recorded about 80 years after her death. So we're unsure really how real they were in there. And then we've got Ostradamus as well, who we talk about who, oh, he's a character. He may or may not have stolen most of his ideas, but he did prophecy through a weight method that I can't remember the specific name of at the moment, but he would look through patterns of events that have happened and tie them to future events that he knows is going to happen. So uh, it would be a lot of astrology, look at patterns of the stars and things that happen at certain days on those the, the star patterns and when those would occur again. I think it's something to do with judiciary. I can't remember the word right now. Oh, judicial astrology. Um, but he also, yes, that's the word. He did a lot of that, but he also looked at a lot of other people's prophecies and kind of took bits from them and use them in his own ones so but he called himself yeah which i like as a mage idea that nostradamus was actually a low-level functionary that was reporting to the celestial masters and stole a bunch of things or tools the sacred astrolabe of the void and maybe pinched them from someone else or he could have been one of the record keepers for the inquisition and as verbena and euthanatoi are kind of screaming their final death prophecies he is off to the corner writing them down what yeah this is also an interesting case where i did not realize the sheer number of types of astrology there were out there so that you have like judicial astrology which is forecasting events based on their relationship to earth which was considered heretical but medical astrology was not considered and tried to tie diseases to the astrological signs and their treatments to the position of the yep. sun and, and moon meteorological which was a type of weather forecasting based on it was considered to be acceptable we now have evidence that nostradamus may have been doing some form of bibliomancy partially you mentioned two characters why do you think nostradamus caught on is there something about the nature of the nostradamus prophecies that are particularly evocative because there have been a lot of prophets and seers out there and i would kill to have the marketing cloud of nostradamus that's all i'm saying I think you just said the correct word there, marketing. Even though he'd put out all these prophecies and donations, the fact that he categorized, stated that he was not a prophet put him in a different position to a lot of the other people around at the time. He was a court astrologer as well. He was he was connected to, to the right people. And the sheer number of prophecies that he put out, some of them were bound to be right. And so they would have connected with people. But I think it was just a very good marketing strategy that he had at the time. And we have a bunch of other prophets that we could use if you don't want to hit the big ones. Gerald Flurry, who I am fond of, was the head of the Philadelphia Church of God, who claimed to be the prophet mentioned in John chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. John Dowie uh, was a faith healer in Zion, Illinois. Uh, Hong Jian Quin, the heterodox Christian sect of the heavenly kingdom of great peace. There's a lot out there. Uh, Swedeborg. Again, as a Philadelphian, we got a bunch of them right in my own backyard. Philadelphia was one of the homes of, of spiritualism. So so the reason I've not kind of gone into more of those other names in the book is one, marketing. <laughs> Big names draw people in. But it's also when you look at the names for modern prophets, you come across some people who may not have been honest 
in the way that they portray their prophecies and you can end up with some quite dangerous cults and interactions in that way so we have obviously when we in, in getting rpgs we often talk about doomsdays and like that and people who predict the end of the world and and things and, and cult leaders these things are still very very relevant so if you are going to look at more modern stuff just and apply them to games especially like world of darkness chronicles of darkness and cult and things like that which are set in the modern world just be aware of the audience that you're going to play with and are they okay with you bringing in some of this more modern stuff so the group out of california jonestown and stuff like that be a little bit more aware of modern connections because some of these are quite and wacko and and stuff like that the people's temple agricultural project yes yeah One of the reasons why I kind of would prefer people stop using the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid. But the other thing that I kind of find interesting is it is frequently the case that people who are part of prophetic or cultic groups believe themselves to be the true incarnation of a faith or belief, where the, the rest of the believership does not agree with that. The example I will use is the Ahmadiyya movement that have the idea of the prophets of God, which is very different than what I would call mainstream Islam. And I don't want to be in a position of claim whether or not something is mainstream Islam or not, I am what is technically known as some white guy who was raised Roman Catholic with no specialty. So to me, one of the importances is to project the numbers on that being like, this is a belief held by this group. This is the non-majority, non-dominant group. Mm. Um, they believe themselves to be the, uh, the true holders of this particular idea or faith or tradition, but most people don't. And I, yeah. I am always worried about giving the false impression of that. Uh, one of the important things to me in Mage is it is not uncommon that when I present a Mage religious group, they will have additional saints, holy days, or whatever that maybe sleeper practitioners do not have. It is important to me to demarcate, these are the things that I added. Don't get it into your head yeah. that this is a <laughs> that this feast day or whatever is a real thing. Yeah. yeah. Where do people usually step in it? Do you feel when they add prophet seers or what have you to their games? All the time, it would it would be that kind of the introduction to the grand story. You go visit the the temple and the priestess there, or the priest tells you you have this grand mission and you need to do this, and the gods are telling you this is the way it should be, and blah 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 blah, and the very boring boring uh, grand prophecies for me bringing them in i like to have them as kind of chance encounters you're just walking down the streets and and you know as a as a storyteller that your players are barking up the wrong tree but you're having fun with it you're enjoying it but you do at some point need to get them back on track or at least point them in a way that will follow the story more. So you you could have a a street corner soothsayer just screaming out random stuff that sounds vaguely prophetic and important that might drop those hints towards this is the way you need to go. Or you go into a bar and you sit down, you order some beer and, and a person comes to the table and starts dealing some cards and you end up having a chat and as the cards get drawn, you suddenly realise you're in a in a tarot reading. To add in the kind of flavour of a world that you're in, the more kind of off-the-cuff meetings that you have with these pros and, and seers, the more, in a way, natural it feels, rather than going, you must go to the temple because that's where you're going to be told what to do. Like, go to a bar and you just see someone sat in the corner shuffling a deck of cards or or, or playing with some pebbles. You're going to go, oh, that, that's a bit weird. What are they doing? Go speak to them and suddenly you get this prophecy. You get this extra hint going, oh, that bloke we were going to go speak to to buy some guns from, yeah, probably not a good idea because he's going to shoot you and kind of drop in hints like that. Or, no, you can go, but be prepared to, to go to the hospital afterwards whenever I give prophecies and divinations. You'll always get some part of the clue of what you need. You'll never, ever not. There's never a point where it's not needed. And it's one of those things where there is the trope where you need to be drawn to the temple or something like that, which is a statement, as it were, about yeah. the power of the religion. Yeah. But if the person who has a prophecy to give to you is able to run into you at a particularly opportune place, that also shows yeah. the power of the religion kind of defining yeah. it separately. 
I would be much more impressed with the person who kind of enters into the story because they were able to use augury or under the auspices of something literally use bird watching to track down your characters. Mm. And I also kind of like the plot line of to kind of draw on the great cultural work of our time, Star Trek DS9, the idea of the reluctant emissary. <laughs> what does yes. it mean for someone not from a belief group to be drawn into the machinations of that belief group? And the advantage of it being a storyteller NPC, you know what happened. So when someone was able to show like what was in the sealed envelope, as it were, or to to reveal that prophecy, um, you kind of have it within your power to make that true. And the way I do that at the table is generally I try and come up with those lists of omens and kind of sprinkle them liberally throughout. It Mm. doesn't always hit because it's an RPG, but sometimes you kind of get this spooky moment where if you can make it so that every major plot point, there is a crow present, or you can see the Eye of Wotan or Kao Dao or at every major turn, I think that is something that we can that we can weave into our stories that is that is pretty subtle, not necessarily as strongly on the head, and kind of makes you go, is there is there something to this? Why do I keep hearing that crow call every time I punch yeah. you in the face? We are putting some gaming tool as a final chapter where we are kind of giving ideas of how you could create prophecies and a little bit of, to, to coin the phrase uh, mad lib prophecies as well the weird nature of what a prophecy is it needs to be specific but not specific you need to give kind of like the clues and the hints in such a weird guarded way that i'm not sure that the the quick prophecy generators would would give you that specificity but also being vague at the same time it's quite a skill And one option I strongly encourage people to use is once you've revealed the text, my two recommendations are going to be Bibliomancy or just Lexicomancy Mm -hmm. using just kind of any arbitrary text, preferably a, a somewhat dense fictional work that you can just pull a paragraph from. Once the characters identify what could be the tie that's the tie now. You didn't go in knowing what the prophecy was going to relate to, but you pull Humpty Dumpty and then you find a character who is precariously balanced on an emotional precipice and you use that for a justification that once that character has been pushed over by a mind effect or something like that, they don't come back or they go marauder or enter into quiet or something like that. Kind of the other one that I am a fan of is Sortilage, a prophecy using a collection of household objects. Um, and it's there are enough cultural associations with just about anything you could pull that you'll come up yep. with a connection to be like, hey, the guiding objects for this endeavor are the billiard ball and the the electric lighter. And if you can't come up with an association that goes to the perfection of the sphere, the contrivance of games, the power of flame to hurt modern technology in the form of that lighter, I can't help you. But again, once an association is drawn, congratulations, you figured out the prophecy, run with it, everyone will think you're a genius. Unless you do what I do and just tell people that ahead of time, and then they get to be part of the fun. Yeah, and one one of the fun things as well is if you give them these kind of hints as to a a prophecy through through objects, and then they come up with their own connections and 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 see the prophecy in the way that they see it, and maybe the rest of the table kind of agrees with them and go, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's got to be it, and you you're sat back going, that's not what I had in my head. Run with it because it will make the story more interesting. Whereas if they got it completely wrong compared to what you had, putting them back on that track with the idea that you had is going to be harder than just running with it and letting the story naturally evolve with that new twist on the, on the prophecy. If, if, if it is a key story point that they're so drastically wrong with it, just make sure that at some point in the future, they're very much aware that they got it wrong and the world as something has happened and uh, it's their fault for understanding it properly. I always, always love that with prophecy as well. Like they're, they're so vague and so obscure sometimes. Misinterpreting them is easy and getting them wrong is part of the course. Tell the players that they've got it wrong. Let them go with it. Maybe drop hints every now and then that something is going on in the background that relates to the real idea of what prophecy was. Just try not to destroy the world with it though. <laughs> And that kind of brings up to a a related one. The next chapter that you have is on castings and readings. Uh, Kind of what is the difference between the two? And what are maybe some kinds of castings or readings that are outside what we may be used to in terms of the rune, the tarot, maybe like the I Chang or something like that? So this this chapter nearly turned into two chapters because 
of casting reading. But casting is very, very simply just throwing something out, cast like the the biblical idea of casting the lots. You are casting stones or runes and throwing them onto something and then seeing the positions of where they are and stuff. And reading is the interpretation of what that cast was. This is why I kind of put them together, because you cast the runes, but then you have to read and interpret where they are and, and what, what's come out. The casting would be casting the runes, whether that's the Futhark or the Ogham runes. To some extent, the I Ching could be considered runes, but it's more of a geomancy thing. Oh, tea, so you've got your obviously tea leaves, Tassiomancy, which recently in more modern times has come into coffee. So coffee grinds. So exactly the same way as Tassiomancy, people would see the, the remains of coffee grinds in the cup and read the patterns that are formed there. Astrology, to some extent, is a form of reading. You are reading the positions of the stars in the heavens. One theme that comes throughout in the whole book is actually is, is a chapter in the book is patterns. Reading is the interpretation and the looking at of patterns and kind of the interpretation of them. Like with tarots, where the cards are laid, whether they're upside down, the right way up, what order they come out on, same runes and stuff. So anything that you can look at to interpret that is static is not moving so it wouldn't be your or auguries and things like that it wouldn't be the movement of of ants or the flight of bees one thing that took me a long time to kind of come to terms with within writing this book was i had to create categories and i had to create chapters now there are no types and specific groups of divination there's a lot of crossover within all of them so astrology aromancy you may mention of ogham script what is that ogham is the irish celtic runic script it's very different we see with the elm and arc it is generally a line with branches and it is specifically historically and academically described as an alphabet. Within recent modern paganism, it has been picked up and used in the similar way to the Futhar. Whether it was traditionally, we don't know. There is no evidence to suggest it was, but there's also no evidence to suggest that it wasn't. Uh, when you say it was used in a similar um, way to the Futhar, what do you mean by that? In modern paganism, each in Nordic paganism, I should say, each rune of the Futh Ark has a alphabetical reading. It represents a letter, but it also represents a physical. It represents a kind of physical idea and also a spiritual idea. And oh, the Ogham rooms have also picked up on it, uh, picked up this this kind of idea. So the simplest one that I can think of straight off the top of my head in the Elder Futh Ark is Fehu, which is cattle or riches. Um, mm-hmm. or wealth it is also the f rune and it's most famously the gandalf rune in lord of the rings the ogham runes also now have these as well whether these are meanings that we see in the ogham runes have been attached through the growth of victorians as they travel around and and took all their folklore ideas and and the rise of the the bacchanalia and stuff like that this whole growth in the victorian period where witchcraft and things kind of seem to get more popular whether it got attached then or whether they got attached earlier but that may be because of the people who may have used it in a magical sense in a divinatory sense were people who couldn't read and write and actually record down what they were doing but the people who could were the richer people and had the money so it could have been a cultural difference and that's just one idea which is kind of interesting because the idea that the educated access to language is something that we don't often take advantage of in mage the idea that you have a syndicate member who uses Mm. written script of an esoteric difficult to master language as a sign of the utter leisure that they have to affect something in the change of the world. And suddenly there is this set of brands that use Ogham inscriptions that are like, that have the line of like, elevate yourself or something like that, that are actually drawing from these runic things, I think is interesting. It is also a case where, for lack of a better term, the Futhark seems like it is something that is often fought over where you have different groups who are kind of using it for nefarious purposes because everyone wants to be tied 
to some ancient culture for good or for yeah. ill. And we will just leave it as that, as as a number of people, both savory and unsavory, are like, no, 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 we are the true inheritors of blank, can get into a messy place. It is also the case that the British Isles and the far north have a lot of weird uh, connections with the traditions. We have the aided within the euthanatoi, so it would make perfect sense that only someone who had experience with uh, die fed in South Wales or the Baronic peoples would be able to to read or, or invoke something, and now you suddenly have that uh, that adventure. But like one of the things that we kind of don't recognize necessarily is alphabets are somewhat new, but the idea of marking something and that symbol having power is not new. So there's almost any region of the world that you could go to and you're like, oh, this was the marking system used by the IFA. We don't consider it necessarily an alphabet, but it was still used for divination and these symbols still have like ties. There are any mm. number of languages that have syllabaries instead, Egyptian, uh, hieroglyphics. I mean, the word hieroglyph is priestly writing, literally. There are a lot of options out there. Oh God, yeah. You can take the same idea. You go, you go to Asia and the kanji and of China and Japan, the, the pictorograms, these all came out of visual drawings of how they saw the world. But then that creates, if you're going to take it through, through an RPG sense, you can go, well, because I'm drawing it and carving it into a stone, like a rune, that imparts a power to it. It imparts the meaning that you've done there. So kawa in Japan, Japanese, it's three lines that look kind of like a river. And if you maybe carve that into a stone and cast it, you could be casting a river and things like that. So you can take all the ideas through that way. The next section you have is patterns. And you kind of made mention of there's a number of divination methods that are uh, tied to things that don't change that you refer to as readings. Mm -hmm. One of the ones looking through here that I thought was kind of interesting was capnomancy. What is capnomancy? In, uh, in RPGs, we know fire, we know pyromancy. Oh, look, let's go blasting the fireball. That's not what pyromancy is. There's many different aspects to it. You mentioned at the beginning before Pyramid we were talking about scapulomancy and plastiomancy. But capomancy is divination through smoke and the patterns that smoke makes. And so you can look at the the smoke as to whether it's thick and cloying and whether it always kind of heads towards you to represent something maybe oppressive is coming towards you. Something is going to latch onto you and, and hold you and, and, and keep you down whether the smoke is thin and wispy and and doesn't smell and just goes straight up to the heaven and the fact that it may be forming a path leading you leading you away and the the work the the path that you are going to travel down is light and easy and will lead you straight to the right correct place one is looking at the patterns that is formed within the smoke maybe there's something later within scrying where you might see the face or the image of somebody within smoke but also the type of smoke it is, whether it's thick, cloying, follows you around, light, wispy, whether you can't see the smoke, whether it's smelly, whether it's heavy, whether it's sooty. It takes in all these into consideration. I like the idea that, one, what is being burned is frequently of importance, that it's one of those things where this needs to be yes. wood that has been dried for nine days beneath the light of a silver moon or something like that. It can only be done in this particular season or what have you. And suddenly your characters, your ecstatic is looking for information about, is this relationship going to go well or is this person to be trusted? And suddenly you need to find a piece of their clothing to ignite to be part of this or maybe hair or something else that has a sympathetic connection to them or items of a particular place. And I I also like the idea that one of the interesting ties is for computers, smoke is one of the hardest things to simulate. It requires a huge amount of random information as well as a, a huge amount of computation to predict how it is going to go. That's that's pretty much my day job. Not predicting smoke, but predicting the way that gas flows. So I know exactly how much computational power that takes. So you kind of bring up a new thing. Is there a, for a more technologically inclined character, I like the idea of there being electrocapnomancy or something like that, where you come up with this incredibly involved physics simulation of something, or you need to be have the ability to predict the, the movement of, uh, of dust in a uniform disk. You've actually just reminded me. So I've literally, about a week ago, maybe mm -hmm. two weeks ago, we published through Darker Days Radio and Drive Through RPG a... Mortals Chronicles of Darkness game from uh, based in Manchester and it's a God Machine Chronicle and it does start off with a high resolution simulation of the universe 
and that, that within that there are patterns that are occult machine runes without having realized it i've basically just done that in in a, it's called paradigm shift you can get it on drive through rpg so there's a i've actually done it in the game which i've not actually realized i'd done so and i like yeah. the idea that for any of your technologically or highly mathematically inclined characters the movements of seemingly random particles and the aggregates they form could be highly predictive it could be something that your character winds up looking at the w map survey instead of just looking at the stars look at the nsi trop and I should trapeze, yeah. Thank you. Of the cosmos <laughs> and being like, hey, by or by reading out this movement of a galactic filament, seemingly, or something like that, you're able to use that to identify magnetic monopoles, which then so on and so forth. And that is kind of the basis of your prediction. All I'll ever say, though, is you want to use magnetic fields and mess everything yeah, up. Yeah, magnetohydrodynamics. There's a reason it's it's hard science at the hard. Yeah, it's the bane of my existence. So. <laughs> paradigm shift i'm always a fan of any reference to the god machine chronicle link to that will be in the show notes we've talked about a bunch of patterns another one that you mentioned here is allomancy the act of divina divination through casting of salt and i like the idea that the only way a character can do a particular form is by using the burial salts or natron that came from a proper mummy or a preserved bog body it is one of those yeah. things where if you go to the wikipedia article on types of divination if it is a noun it probably has a type of divination tied to it yes there is a wikipedia page called methods of divination and oddly there's a lot of very very good useful and correct information on that page or at least it links to then the correct wikipedia page which does have full-on historical references and is actually quite well looked at and, and to me looking over something like that it's really neat because we now have another source in our games where your character takes a random cell phone picture of a person and by looking at the pattern of dirt on the ground we now have a potential sympathetic source that can be used to justify a magical effect or the the requirement for finding a rare material and as you mentioned patterns mage is interesting because as a game there's no such thing as apophenia it could all be real so basically anything can be a pattern is one thing that can go you, you can see patterns in everything and it's just kind of how do you associate that with a divination? How can how can you apply the bubbling of a pasta sauce on the stove as a divination, Regiment, for example? Yes. <laughs> um, there are patterns. Life is patterns. It is not so ridiculous because in Mage, it can work. The idea of lightning divination was something that the Etruscans followed. But who is to say that your weird scientist can't use a Tesla coil? to do the same thing all almost all of these can have contemporary trappings and vice versa and i and that's why i find like discussions of divination and such to be so fascinating there, yeah. there's a lot more in your text certainly but before we get too far out there one of the ones that was fascinating you have is divination based on animals and not necessarily just like reading entrails but augurs who were the priests that were tasked with divine interpretation yeah. by studying the behavior of birds how long have we been watching animals? What are some of the examples of that? Animals as divination. Everybody always goes on about horror specs and, and looking at entrails and stuff. But as you mentioned there, augurs, again, is something that we have been doing since early Roman times. They were vastly important people generally within the Roman Empire. And before that, there is evidence of people examining things within Babylonia and um, looking at the hearts and lungs of these animals and, and, and making divinations from these. So animals have, have been part of human religious rights for thousands of years so they appear throughout all of our mythology in egypt they were worshipped uh, cats were worshipped as, as gods and there are forms of divinations through the through the behavior of cats so we talk about augurs where we study the behavior of birds but it's not just the behavior of the birds it's also what type of bird it is what time of year it is are they making any noises are they all male birds are they all female birds a mixture of species and you can take this across to other animals as well herds of cattle the way the herd of cattle move has been used as divination before so sheep and sheepdogs we can look at the ideas of Hugin and Mugin from Norse mythology the the messengers of the gods so it's something that I like to talk about is the the, the movement of ants because whenever you see ants moving through a, through a wood or a forest you can see different patterns 
that's the way that they move and things. There's uh, the roosters, so Electriomancy is another big one, which is, again, one of the early forms that comes from Africa, where a rooster would go around and peck corn from the ground. Quite often, the corn would be laid next to letters or numbers or shapes, and the order in which the, 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 the rooster would peck at these would give a divination. So This is a great section. You have a lot of examples in here. Uh, you have hippomancy, which is divination from watching the movement of horses. Suddenly your characters need to track down emo horse girl to get appropriate amount of information on what is going to happen. <laughs> and I think this would be fascinating, especially for instance, uh, Philadelphia has a livery and stable company. And to do this mm. prediction, we suddenly need to close down a city park for an hour or two to just kind of let this horse go wild. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a fun thing that your characters are going to have to deal with the uh, the authorities, but also people are going to be kind of curious what this horse is doing. I like the idea that they come upon a dead body. Uh, one of your characters just gingerly takes out a lollipop, licks it, puts it on the body, and just kind of waits for ants to come out. And suddenly we have this mumomantic phenomenon occurring. You have something like a Lyromancy, or another case where you need the animal but you don't have it, but one of the characters in your group has life four and maybe needs to transform into the form of a cat to finish this appropriate piece. As you mentioned, electriomancy is divination from the, the peckings of chickens or roosters. And I like the idea that you have a large number of roosters that are somewhere in the umbra, which are being used to generate arcane random noise to encrypt messages. Will enough chickens mm -hmm. with enough bits of corn to scratch at eventually predict the work of Shakespeare? I think we're all familiar with that common thing but this is another one of those examples where you're like there's an animal with that name it exists if oh yeah yeah if, if someone's wanted to divine something they don't have anything other than one specific animal they're going to use that animal in some way shape or form and I like the idea that a character specializes in it, so they always carry around their oracular rooster or their divinatory rooster with them, and that is their familiar. Obviously, as well, in there, uh, there's a lot of other things. So I go into kind of like the more folklory stuff of the magpies, more rather than just the the augury kind of side of things. Little cultural things that we 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 do. So in England, we salute the magpie and one for sorrow, two for joy. And you could kind of bring these things in into games as well. With the if you, if you don't maybe salute the magpie as you go past what effects does that have what does the magpie then go who does it go and tell what was the specific reason that magpie was there and what happened so if if, if you're walking around and the storyteller and you said and you pass two magpies and you just walk on past what is the effect of that there's also the specific animals again i talk about the white stag in there which is cross-cultural across many folk laws and folk tales from around the world the white stag so I also like the idea that uh, it raises questions as to what counts. So we make mention to the white stag. Does it count that it is a progenitor creation? Does it count that life three was used to do this? Or is there some sort of white stagness that needs to otherwise be incepted into the creature? I like the idea in a game that's particularly superstition focused that you do have some sort of omen tracker that over the course of the game, you get an increasing number of requirements and, and variants of the echoes flaw that the characters need to keep until someone's like this is stupid and then suddenly someone botches their next role and you're not entirely sure why there's a system in uh, age of sigma soulbound called the doom tracker which basically tells you how but the world is is getting and you could, could apply the same idea but to the number of omens that are being shown to you and, and uh, to a point where it might kick off so in a way kind of like the blaze in the dark those endless number of timers that you end up with with on your table going ah which one am i on now which one am i changing and i love the idea but i hate using it yeah and it's also one of those things where as a storyteller sometimes it is useful just to have a one or two random items that I can use that provide inspiration. I don't necessarily personally believe in the tarot as a divinatory tool, but it is capable of providing revelation in the form that will often give people a new way of looking at a circumstance, and that insight will allow a breakthrough. So there's a there's a lot to work with. It is one of those things where if you can think it up, someone else has probably investigated it and i am very strongly of the opinion that you should try and garb it in a uh, new take come up with a technological version come up with a shamanic or an animistic interpretation of it likewise there is probably a religious variant of it where you have an animal that is tied to the saints or something like that and can be used so it fits into a lot of paradigms and we are just kind of touching the surface 
as soon as I kind of started doing this, I go, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do it as this like small twenty page booklet thing, and then I started writing, and I went, um, guys, this is bigger than, and as I say, we're now hitting probably about 120 pages so it, it's going to be a big book it's a5 it's going to be a5 size but it's going to be quite quite a lot a5 is about six inches by eight inches for those of us who still use freedom units so uh, <laughs> uh it's something it was kind of the standard for indie rpgs for a while a little bit shy of six by nine merc org i think is a5 mm-hmm. maybe slightly bigger yep so we have talked about a lot of things. Are there any other bits of wisdom or insight or interesting research notes that you'd like to impart before we just ask the question? So where can we uh, go back this thing? Uh, We could talk about this for for hours and hours and hours and hours. They want to know any more. As I say, there are two more chapters in there, one on summoning um, and there's one on scrying. And then there's a final chapter, which is on gaming tools and kind of ways you can build your own profits and seers and build your own divinations based upon each of the chapters and stuff. And if we are interested in backing it, where can we do that? So it will be on Kickstarter as October the 27th. So it's probably already live by now. We are running for four weeks. It is, so we'll finish on November the 24th. I don't know the prices off the top of my head. I want to say five British pounds for the PDF, but I may be wrong. So don't quote me on that one. It is called Eye to the Void by Hive Mind Games. There will be hopefully a link in the show notes to either the go watch it here page or this is where it is live now page you can find it at hivemindgames.co.uk as well wonderful david thank you so much for your time i wish you all the best in this project thank you very much for letting me talk about it it's been such a great and interesting project to work on it's kind of taken me in roots i never thought i'd go so This has been Mage the Podcast, where if you ever wanted to know your future, we'd advise you investigate trochomancy, which is divination by looking at wheel ruts. This episode is made possible by Josh Hillerup, Oracle of Divination via Armomancy, which is apparently a real thing where you interpret your own shoulder blades. Buck Gregory, Oracle of Calcomancy, which is divination from striking bowls. Christopher Phillips, Oracle of Fractomancy, which is divination from exploring fractals. The Crew of Erebus, Oracle of Ichnomancy, which is divination via footprints. Mikhail, Oracle of Omphalomancy, which is divination from considering navels. And Jay Widener, Oracle of Scatheromancy, which is divination from watching beetle trails. Additionally, I'd like to thank Alex, Alexia, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Anon, Bedurfi, Birdo, Blaze Hibbert, Blake Ryan, Boo, Boogers to the Sixth, Brad of the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Dan Svensson, David Roy, Dennis Osborne, Derek Semsick, Fraga Rock, Gargle Noir, George Lara, Guy Conan Stewart, Ia Bull, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jeff Brin, John Magnuson, Jolyn Andes, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Morgan Aran, Nathan Weaver, Nabero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Puka G, Rachel Grace, Ralph Scheinhammer, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rob H, Ryan Kennedy, Samuel Tobin, Sean Gallagher, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, and Matt Rules. Our EP shout-out is to Alexia, who I can only assume is the namesake for the brand of sweet potato fries, which is the sole food consumed by a friend of mine during exam season. Alexia, thank you for preventing her starvation. I also found out there's something called Pure Alexia, which sounds like a term for whatever your signature move is, Alexia, such as a skateboard trick, cracking wise about somebody's mama, albeit respectfully, or a type of innocent showboating that shows that you know how to break all the rules, albeit in a predictable and safe way. But it turns out it's a term for when you lose the ability to read, but your other language skills are unaffected. I found this confusing and think that instead they should use an unambiguous term like Uncanny Alexia, Signature Alexia, or pure uncut Colombian Alexia. Thank you for your support. If you'd rather listen on YouTube, search Mage the Podcast on YouTube to find our full library there. If you super like this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at magethepodcast at gmail.com or at magethepodcast on Twitter. We will hop in Discord community at discord.me slash magethepodcast. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform of your choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to magethepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye.